Okay, my name is Steve Smith, S-M-I-T-H, and I was a Hel Cobra helicopter pilot with Delta Company, 158th Aviation Battalion of the 101st Airborne Division from November of 1969 to October of 1970. And I'm Kenneth Peterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. Uh, I was a uh, first lieutenant, then captain, helicopter pilot, flew Hueys with the B Company, 158th Aviation Battalion, 101st Airborne Division, Lancers was the call sign. I was Lancer 8. And I was in Vietnam from August of 70 to August of 71. Can you tell me a story about how uh, you met Steve and uh, a mission? Can you, can you start that story from the beginning again? Well, I, I was fairly new in country. I, I, I believe this particular mission was at the beginning of September to mid-September, and I think that Steve thinks it went maybe a little bit earlier. It might have been the end of August, something like that. Um, and um, I was on my first combat mission, my first combat flight, and I was flying with a, uh, a, a CW-2, Chief Warrant Officer 2, Billy Walker, who was very experienced, and uh, was going to show me the ropes. And we were flying around the O'Reilly Ripcord area uh, in the Ashaw Valley area of, of Vietnam. We, we flew out of Camp Evans. Both the Lancers and the Redskins flew out of Camp Evans. And uh, we were, the mission that day was uh, simply taking in food and supplies. And in this particular case, uh, the area we were going to, we were supposed to be taking out bodies. Um, as we uh, came up on the O'Reilly Ripcord area and where the LZ was, the landing zone was, um, Billy said we're going to have to do a high overhead approach. Uh, that meaning we'd start out at 1,500 feet and as quickly as possible circle down uh, above the trees and then, and then settle um, 150 feet or so down uh, from the tops of the trees in a hover and go straight on down because that's the size of the hole we had to go into. As we touched ground, and I, uh, I'll add that Billy just did a great job of teaching me how to do this, along with the crew chief and door gunner that were just superb at saying, as we're dropping down into the trees, little left, sir, little right, sir, little left, sir, little forward, you're, 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 move slightly to the left, and so on, until we settled down into the ground. Then we started taking, almost immediately, 75 uh, millimeter recoilless fire into our area. And of course, the troops on the ground are saying, out, out, out. I started to pick the aircraft up, and uh, Billy said, I've got the controls. And I said, you've got the controls, and I took the radios. And uh, he started to pick the aircraft up. He had to come up now 150 feet uh, straight up in order to gain translation lift in order to start to fly the aircraft forward. In the meantime, uh, Steve uh, and his wingman are circling us on the outside. And as we starting to come up, um, uh, you want to pick it up from there. What did you see uh, as far as the 75 recoilers? Well, we saw uh, explosions and uh, we saw tracer fire from other automatic weapons in the area. And uh, we could pick a spot. They were coming from a lot of different places. So we couldn't necessarily uh, determine exactly which ones was affecting it any more than any others. Uh, I was flying a Cobra gunship, which, which, is, uh, which is totally responsible for uh, fire suppression. That was our mission. We were supposed to guard these guys, escort them in and out of their, the areas that they had to go into. And there were two of us, myself and uh, 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 my wingman, who were out uh, supporting all the aircraft in that area that day, that day and they had, uh, we were primarily responsible for him and uh, those guys and the other aircraft that were in that area. So you, you ended up seeing or firing at where the 75 right. was. Right. There was an explosion uh, and it goes 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet in the air. They hit an ammo dump. It was like a mushroom cloud. I mean, I, I attributed it to an atomic explosion. It was so big and so loud. Uh, we're now coming up out of the out of the trees and starting to move forward, uh, and of course there's a lot of chatter going on in the radios, um, and uh, uh, I start to see <laughs> orange things coming by uh, up about face high, coming towards the aircraft, and I'm thinking I'm brand new in country, I'm thinking orange bugs, you know, like a windshield on a car. I mean, 
So uh, we, we start to move forward, and in the meantime, uh, either you or, or your wingman mm -hmm. sees the 51 cal that's actually firing at us, and you go in after it. And you want to... Okay, well, Joe Keller was flying the other. He was my wingman, the first lieutenant, and he was my wingman, and we had seen where the fire was coming from, and we were engaging that area to try to suppress the fire so they could get back into that LZ and do what they had to do. And one of the passes, I had received some fire, and I was hit by this 51 several, in several places, including my transmission in my helicopter. Now, in a helicopter, uh, if you lose an engine in a helicopter, you can what they call auto-rotate and safely get to the ground. But if you, your transmission s stops, your blades stop, and then you pretty much have the, have the flight characteristics of a rock, and it's pretty much all over for you. So I knew that from the instruments in my aircraft, I knew that the transmission had been hit because I was losing oil pressure in the transmission. So I knew at that point that I had to, uh, to find a place, a secure place to land. Uh, and my radios had also already been shot out also, so I was unable to communicate with my wingman or him or anybody. So I was out looking for somewhere to land, which was fairly safe. And I missed where uh, Joe Keller had hit that, uh, had hit the, uh, the ammo, it had blown the side of the mountain, but I could hear them on the radio talking about it, but I couldn't do anything about it. I was just trying to save my own butt and uh, my, my front seat's butt, trying to find somewhere to land. We finally did and uh, managed to land safely. Then uh, I was on a secure fire base that at the time was uh, being operated by the, uh, the, the South Vietnamese Army, so I had to crawl through their defend their barbed wire and get to their command post to try to get a radio to let somebody know where I was, because nobody did. I had no way to communicate with them, so I finally found the uh, officer in charge of the South Vietnamese officer on this fire base, O'Reilly, and was able to get his ra ask for his radio, you know, kind of a sign language because he couldn't understand what I was saying and I couldn't understand what he was saying. And I was able to adjust the radio so I could call back to my base. And of course, when they heard from me, they you know say everybody's looking for you. You know where are you? You know I told explained to them where I was, and I told them my aircraft was damaged. You know wasn't flyable anymore. So they said, well we'll contact somebody to come get you there at O'Reilly. And these guys came back and they picked me up off of O'Reilly and took me back to. Uh, In the meantime, we're we're chatting as we're looking for him. We're circling, trying to find him. Everybody's trying to trying to find him, and uh, we're talking to his wingman, and uh, and luckily uh, he had taken out the 51 cal, so the little orange bug stopped coming face high across here. We were able to gain translational lift, and I might add that the, again the crew chief and door gunner just did a superb job getting us out of the trees as quickly as we did, and and uh, Billy Walker. Uh, the, the chief warrant officer, the, the, the PIC, pilot command, he was just superb. He was just as calm as day. You know, I just, just worked it, you know, as if it was a matter of fact as he's getting us out, until I told him the orange bug story later on. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, uh, we're circling and we're talking and then we spot him. Uh, we spot Steve's aircraft down on the uh, O'Reilly area and uh, we go back down to swing back down to pick them up. And by the way, we have a CD recording, <laughs> believe it or not. In that day and age, Billy had for the first time put a, rec put a recorder and put an earbud in his ear and was recording a lot of what occurred. Now there's a, what we call the, uh, uh, the dead period. Nixon-like dead the, period, the dead in, period the tape, in the tape. In the tape. <laughs> when all the action took place, he forgot to turn the... Uh, it was a cassette <laughs> tape. It was an old, one of the old cassette tape <laughs> yeah, recorders. he didn't turn it over, so we, we don't have that portion of it. We have this first part of it and we have the last part of it as we're going in and trying to find uh, Steve so we go in we sit down on the ground and Steve and his, his uh, co-pilot get on and I don't know who it was that grabbed me from the back of the was, was it you or was it your guy grabbed me from, from from the back and of course we're sitting in the seats and they hopped in the back and said get the fuck out of here <laughs> you know and off we go and I now start to explain the orange bugs to Billy who says oh, that was 51 cal fire and and he says what where we hit we had, we've got it now he's 
we've got to check it out, which we did, and we hadn't, we hadn't been hit, luckily, because Steve had gone in and taken out the, uh, the 51 Cal, and of course, and he or his wingman had taken out the 75 recoil. I think there was probably more fire going on than we, re than we realized as we're coming out of the trees as to how much was really going on. Um, and we proceeded then to, to take uh, uh, Steve and his co-pilot back to Camp Evans, and we went on for the rest of the rest of the day. And Billy is doing, in, you know, instructing the brand new pilot how to go into different fire bases, uh, uh, you know, how to land uh, on on, on uh, high areas uh, so that I don't drop off the other end. And he went on that, and again the pilot co-pilot. I mean, if you could listen to the CD. You'd, you'd hear how professional uh, everybody was, uh, and I, I also feel how uh, how naive I was on the on the radio as I listened to myself after all these after all these years. Uh, you then met uh, uh, you ran into Billy later on. You yeah. want to tell that? Uh, yeah. Well, I've met him at several of these reunions. But it was forty years. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It was quite a quite a few years after that. Uh, I had corresponded with him, like him on the phone or on the computer or whatever for for years, and I'd seen him, and I've seen him several times since. And he recalls the story of when I first talked to him. Uh, we all had unit patches on our flight suits, like uh, well, not necessarily for 101st, but they all were for our, for our Pacific, Pacific units. So I had one and I had torn it off my, when they picked me up, I tore it off my, my flight suit and I gave it to him as a, as a souvenir. You're and, getting rid of D-Rose. You shouldn't have been out there flying anyway, but yeah. <laughs> no, I had time to go. But uh, uh, when I first met him, he, he, he pulled it out and said, I still have this from all those years ago, you know. And I, he said, you want it back? I said, no, 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 that's yours. And I told him how much I appreciated him coming to get me after, you know. Because like I say, as I was flying back trying to find somewhere to land, I could hear them hear them on the radio, but I couldn't transmit to them. And I'm hearing them talking about the explosions, and they're all, they have a good job. And I'm saying, well, guys, better come start coming looking for me. Because <laughs> I'm running out of options here, you know. So. I got a question for you, Steve. Yeah. You never got a mayday signal off as you were going down because you were. No, I could not. I could not transmit on my radios. I could hear on my radios because of the, 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 the gunfire or the rounds had severed part of the part of the wiring. You took around in the, in the radio compartment. Yeah, in the radio compartment and in that transmission and so forth. There was a hole in the transmission about that's about the size of a softball, which when you stop and think about it, I mean, there's pieces of the transmission and it's a pretty delicate piece of equipment. You know, your transmission on your car, if your transmission goes out, you're going to stop. And like I say, if your engine goes out in a helicopter, you're, if you're any, any part of a pilot, you can pretty much safely land if you have a, you know, a decent place to flat area to land, but if your transmission goes out, then your, your blades are going to stop and you're just going to go How like a rock. did you make it? From well, I was, trying, I was trying to get back. We worked in the mountains a lot, but once you got past the mountains, there was yeah, the area flattened out as you got closer to the water, and it, that's where I was trying to get. But I was thinking, okay, I've got a certain amount of time. My transmission, the gauge that measures the, the, uh, the pressure in my transmission oil is going down, down, which tells me I'm losing the oil. So I've got to make a decision, you know, how far do you think I can get? You know, I need to find the closest place I can, which is fairly safe. And then we're in the mountains, trees, jungles, you know, there's not a whole lot of places to, to land other than in trees. So that was the, about the closest place I could get to. I couldn't get far enough. How far are you away from your from it wasn't. South Korean base that you landed? How far did you have to travel on foot? And where was No, I landed on that base. I was able to land on the base, so I was right there. No. Yeah. We weren't far from the original LZ. It was not it was not that far, but with jungle uh, probably and probably five miles, seeing, maybe five miles or so. It's hard seeing a, an aircraft sitting down in the sitting down on the ground as we went searching for him. Mm -hmm. um, in, in any case as we took off and, and went back uh, uh, and did the rest of the missions for the day. Uh, it had already gotten back to the O Club, the officers club. And as I walked in that night, the orange bug story was, <laughs> uh, have you seen any more orange bugs today? That went on for a couple of months afterwards. And its story is still told. I'm still asked to tell the story. Um, and uh, I, I thought that uh, it was uh, the, my first reunion. I got I got online and saw that there was a 101st Association, and this was about five years ago. There was a 
a Lancer Association, and I call up and talk to uh, uh, Lance Ruck, who says, it's one is a reunion in three weeks. I came to the reunion, and at that particular reunion, they, uh, the, one of the individuals, this was the aviation dinner night, one of the individuals, uh, one of the pilots, had a farm, and they actually flew a Huey and set it on the farm. And I got in the right seat, and Billy Walker got in the left seat, and we hadn't been in a helicopter together like that in 40 years. I saw I have pictures of that. And, uh, and I got to spend time with him. Uh, I got to spend, uh, to see my old company commander, Paul Cole. Uh, and I think it was the next reunion when you were, when you were there. Could have been, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that uh, the reunion after that, uh, Steve came up to me and said, uh, and said, thank you. And I, I thank you. I mean, I have years now <laughs> since then because mm. of you mm. and your wingman, and I really, really, really appreciate well, it a lot. Thank you.